Thank you very much, Fred. Um, Steph and I would like to add our welcome to Fred's and thank you all uh, for breaking away from all Cairo all the time uh, to come hear about something else. Um, <clears throat> As you know, it's a tradition for Americans to start talks like this with a joke. That was about as close as I could get. Uh, I realized this morning that I don't know any Kim Jong-il jokes. Um, as part of the launch of this book, we are, we've started a blog on the Peterson Institute website uh, called North Korea Witness the Transformation. At the end of my presentation, I'll actually put the blog address up on the screen. Uh, but I thought, I haven't asked my co-author, uh, Professor Haggard, about this, but I thought that um, we might run a joke contest that, uh, you know, over the next week or so, anybody who submits the, uh, the best, you know, North Korea joke will win a free copy of the book. Um, that probably beats winning a trip to North Korea. What I'm going to do in, uh, over the next few minutes is to sketch out in broad terms the findings and recommendations of our book. Before I do, however, I'd like to thank uh, some people who were instrumental in bringing this project to fruition. First of all, the Smith Richardson MacArthur and Academy of uh, Korean um, Studies Foundations for Financial Support. A number of research analysts who are mentioned in the uh, acknowledgments, uh, one of whom, Jen Lee, ought to be here today, although she went off to a doctor's appointment uh, earlier. That's not a good sign when, when your research uh, analyst runs off for a doctor's appointment rather than showing up for the uh, launch of the book. Um, I hope that's not an editorial comment. Um, and then finally, of course, the Peterson Institute Publications Department, which put together what I think is a very attractive book uh, in record time over the holidays. Um, all of these people have earned our deep gratitude. The book is based on two large-scale surveys of North Korean refugees. The first of these was carried out in 2005 under the auspices of the US Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Some of uh, 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 people from the board of that organization are here today. Um, the, th that's, th that survey was implemented by Professor uh, Yunok Chang. I helped work on the study survey design. And then Steph and I helped her with the analysis of the data once it was collected. The survey was conducted under very difficult conditions in China. The people that we were interviewing uh, were, in effect, illegal aliens facing forcible deportation to North Korea and very uncertain fates uh, if they were uh, deported. And so after we produced uh, that work, the Smith Richardson Foundation approached us and offered to fund uh, a second survey to be done in South Korea which Steph and I did in November of 2009. And under the much more secure legal environment in South Korea, we were able to uh, administer a much longer and more nuanced questionnaire. And uh, we were quite uh, happy to see that the results from the second uh, South Korean survey largely track the results that we had obtained earlier in China. And there was much more methodological detail about these two surveys provided in the appendix of the book, uh, which has been circulated. These refugees are of interest for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that they, uh, is, is, is for themselves. They represent a first order humanitarian problem and chapter two of the book is largely devoted to um, uh, documenting their travails. Most of these people suffer from um, pervasive psychological distress, uh, which is causally linked to their experiences in both North Korea and in China, through which the, the vast majority of them uh, exit North Korea. Most of these people uh, in clinical settings that we interviewed in China would have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And indeed, uh, in South Korea, there is a medical establishment, including people we've worked with, who actually work with these people, who, who suffer some severe psychological uh, distress from their experiences. What we find is that or, or th one of the things that was interesting about the research is that we, we find that the famine experience of the 1990s continues to reverberate through uh, uh, North Korean society. Um, having lost a family member in the famine or being in the category of people who knew about the international aid program but believed that they were not a beneficiary of it in their time of need, uh, those are profoundly demoralizing experiences. And we find that in our statistical analyses, these sorts of personal events 
are even more important than incarceration in the prison system in terms of contributing to psychological distress. The second reason uh, that we are interested in the refugees is as a window into a very information constrained and opaque society. And I will quickly sketch out three broad themes of the book. The first are the economic and uh, social changes to which the refugees attest. Now, being of a certain age, and an NBA basketball fan, I always wanted to be the czar of the telestrator, and I guess this is my opportunity, since I don't have a, a, a laser pointer. You can see in the uh, left-hand panel, one of, the question, one of the things we found that was very interesting was just how rapidly and completely the centrally planned economy collapsed in the 1990s, and, and markets developed to meet people's needs. So when we asked the refugees, what was the best way to make money in North Korea? And we divided them into um, uh, by what time they left the country to get a sense of how these developments had changed over time. What we find is that green part, the green part, green for money, is the best way of making money in North Korea. But what's interesting is the growth sector, this red part, is corrupt or criminal activities. We also asked them, what's the, what's the best way of getting ahead? And the, uh, the uh, answer was to become a state or party official. But it appears that um, these positions are prized not so much out of patriotism, but because they are increasingly seen as a platform to engage in economic predation on the rest of the population. All these people report increasing levels of bribery and corruption, and in particular, the refugees that we interviewed who had formerly been employed in government or party offices uh, report more and rising corruption among their uh, colleagues and peers. The central authorities seem to be aware of this, and the people who uh, worked in those offices also report increased time devoted to ideological indoctrination. This notion of using your state position to extort from your neighbors is the second theme of uh, this part of the book. And that is the state's criminalization of the day-to-day -day economic activity that a typical non-elite North Korean citizen would engage in. What we find is that the North Koreans have, in some changes to their legal code, greatly broadened the definition of economic crime. In effect, roughly speaking, making any non-elite probably a criminal, in that they violate some one of these strictures in their day-to-day -day life. So everyone's a criminal, and the police are given absolutely extraordinary discretion in whom they arrest and for how long they are detained. And notice I use the word detained, not sentenced. Of the people who went to the prison system, we find that the vast majority, 80 7% report never having any kind of trial or formal legal procedure uh, associated with their detention. Once they are detained, they are subjected to absolutely horrific conditions. Even in the lowest level facilities that are often used to house these so-called economic criminals, the likelihoods in, during a typical sentence on the order of weeks or months of seeing an execution or somebody beaten to death or somebody tortured is actually quite high, as you see in that lower panel. This creates an absolutely extraordinary mechanism for economic predation and extortion. You know the police can grab you, they can put you, they can put your family in these facilities where you know that horrible things happen. And they can also release you from those facilities. So there is a tremendous incentive to pay bribes, to protect yourself and keep you and your family from becoming ensnared in uh, this system. So the penal system, in addition to performing its traditional role of dealing with crime as we would know it and political repression, we, we argue now has another function, and that is basically economic predation on the part of low-level officials. So what are the political implications of this? We find that North Koreans increasingly have access to the foreign media. Um, and we, uh, uh, as you see in this upper panel, the blue block, which is people who have access, steadily rises over each time period. 
But what's cu really curious about that, that one, and I call this the Bill Clinton chart, is this middle panel, the green panel, which completely disappears. Those are the people who, who smoked, but they didn't inhale. Those are the people who had access to foreign media, but didn't consume. And as we can see, that inhibition has completely disappeared. And this access to foreign media is not strictly a youth phenomenon. It's not strictly an urban phenomenon. Penetration rates used to be higher in urban areas than the rural areas, but the rural areas have largely caught up. So people increasingly have access to foreign media, and access to foreign media is associated with increasingly negative and dissenting views about the regime. Indeed, well, I'll show you some data in the next, uh, next slide. The, the meta-narrative of the regime, which is that all its problems are due to hostile foreign forces, is increasingly disbelieved by the population. That said, this remains an atomized population in a society characterized by low level of tr trust. There's a lot of discontent, but there still is great inhibition about communicating that discontent. At least that is what we find in our surveys. We also find something that we call the market syndrome, which is basically a cluster of characteristics. We find that the people um, engaged in market activities are more likely to cite political motives for their exit from the country. They're 50% more likely to have been arrested. They hold distinctly more negative views about the regime. And most importantly, they are more likely to communicate those views to their peers. In effect, the market is emerging as a semi-autonomous zone of social communication and, in effect, and, and potentially political organizing. And from that standpoint, the state is right to fear the market. One last issue before moving on to the policy agenda. We have interviewed refugees. These people have voted with their feet. By definition, they have negative views of, of, of the regime, almost by definition. So the question is, are these views representative of the remaining population? Well, ultimately, there's no way to know. No one does public opinion polls in North Korea. But what we've done in the book is use multivariate statistical models, and we spend a lot of time on this, to try to figure out if one controls for both demographic characteristics, if one controls for life experiences, if one controls for every observable characteristic you can of these respondents, do they appear to be distinct from the remaining population? And what we find when we do these counterfactual uh, projections is in general, we have slightly oversampled groups or people with particular life experiences that may have unusually negative views. But that at least at the 95% confidence interval, the fact that those views are representative of the remaining resident population, that null hypothesis cannot be rejected. So we think that these are probably, as, as, as well as we can tell, using all the statistical tools at our disposal, that these responses are generally representative of the remaining resident population. In general, we think that is in fact the case, and these results uh, should be taken uh, uh, seriously. But throughout the book, we go through this exercise of generating the counterfactuals and then reporting these results. So you yourself can assess to what extent you think these views are representative. Now, this is the Institute for International Economics, so we need to talk about, pol we have to give policy prescriptions. And in the book, we do this in two broad, under two broad rubrics. The first is a kind of more specific uh, agenda for uh, human rights and humanitarian concerns. And in this matrix, we, it's basically a two by two matrix. We have a set of uh, uh, policies uh, towards the refugees per se, but the refugees are really only the tip of the iceberg of a much, they're the visible manifestation of a much bigger and broader problem of human rights within North Korea. So we also have a set of policies devoted towards the remaining resident population. We further divide those policies into what we call direct policies and indirect policies. Direct policies are the ones that involve the North Korean government. These are the typical sort of um, uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic sorts of, of negotiations or solutions. And then there's a sec second set of indirect policies that we can pursue regardless of the stance of the North Korean government. Now we understand that implementing some of these indirect policies, be it providing more information to the population of North Korea, or uh, providing scholarships to uh, North Korean refugees 
could create tensions with the North Korean government and could make it more difficult to make progress on the direct policy agenda. We understand that, but, but it is our judgment, all things considered, that, um, that that risk is warranted and that we should pursue this two-track policy. We also talk about engagement with North Korea more generally with a special emphasis on the economic aspects of engagement. And basically what we want to do or what we want to accomplish through that economic engagement is twofold. We want to first address the material deprivation of the North Korean population, which for large parts of the population remains quite severe. But that's not the only thing we want to do. We also want to encourage institutional change in economics and politics in a constructive direction. So it's not just we want to get, make people get richer, but we want to get people richer in a particular sort of way that contributes to societal evolution in a particular sort of way. The obvious kind of hierarchy of forms of engagement are humanitarian assistance, development assistance, and commercial engagement. Humanitarian assistance, we would argue, should be divorced from politics. There is no, we don't see any ethical basis for holding a poor family in Changjin or an elementary school student in Wonsan responsible for the behavior of the North Korean government over which they have absolutely no influence. So humanitarian aid, we would argue, should be divorced from politics. Development assistance and commercial engagement is a different matter, however. Uh, and we go through in some detail in chapter six of the book how we think we can do things to structure that engagement, to push things in a way that, um, that we think is, um, is uh, most appropriate. So where does this lead, leave us? Well, North Korea, as presumably everyone in this room knows, faces a looming succession uh, driven by Kim Jong-il's uh, age and apparent um, non-robust health. Um, our surveys dis document widespread discontent, but we also see a complete absence of civil society institutions capable of channeling that discontent into any kind of constructive political action. What we do observe is what uh, the sociologist James C. Scott, in a different context, called everyday forms of resistance. People quietly just exiting the system and essentially becoming detached from it uh, uh, through this kind of, um, through various stratagems to, to distance themselves and disentangle themselves from the state. And in that sense, the, the market, as I said, not only represents a way of addressing people's material needs, but it also is an important social role in that it is this kind of zone of autonomy for individual or zone of individual autonomy and personal freedom. So in that sense, we should be promoting the market within North Korea, not only because it addresses the material concerns, which are quite serious, but also because it, uh, it will push the society in a particular way that we think is constructive. In the end, we think there ought to be engagement. We want to see two-way flows of information. We want to see people moving back and forth, partly to use a Marxist phrase, to intensify the contradictions. We want to make it more and more evident to the population of North Korea the costs that that system imposes upon them. And that is not to say that doing that is necessarily going to bring down the regime or it is going to force Kim Jong-il's successors to pursue radical reform, but what it will start to do is place political constraints within North Korea on a government now that is able to behave with an extraordinary degree of non-accountability with the disastrous results that we have observed over the last 15 years. Um, these end my formal remarks. Steph and I look forward to engaging with you. And as I mentioned at the outset, we're launching a blog, or we have launched a blog. Uh, there is the address. Uh, so we look forward to engaging with you not only this afternoon, but continuing that engagement in the future uh, through the internet. Thank you very much.